but uh, we will also do the questions that Jackson has in, in email. Well, here I am. I'm back. I was muted. And oh, so okay. What I've got for you tonight are questions that I received now in October. We've been doing September's questions. Of course, I can't answer all these questions that come in simply because I don't have time. And second of all, some questions are, well, you'll hear a couple of them tonight. They're very hard to answer. The first one is... Some of them are repeats too, right? Yes, occasionally. Probably because I repeated them. Well, I'm just saying, uh, I, I, I would assume that some people might ask similar questions because some questions are more popular than others, like yeah. ca calendar questions, you know, things like that. Well, these are anyway. pretty much singular questions tonight. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. I'll let you go. Sorry for interrupting. That's okay. How many slept with their sister in the Bible? That's the first one. How many? How many slept with their sister in the Bible? That's an interesting question. I've got to leave it up to you. Do we do we have a person uh, who do we know who asked the question? Do we need uh, to be concerned? No, I had to go back and I I would have to go back and reference the person. So, I don't well, want to do that. I know you said I know you said you want uh, me to answer, but did you have any thoughts on that? Well, I was thinking about some people's um, interpretation of where Cain got his wife. I think you mentioned that a couple times ago, but I don't think that, I don't think it was his sister. I think that it was of the pre-Adamic race that he went out to because it said, this is the same Cain that he also started a city and named it Enoch. But who else in the Bible would have slept with her sister? It's against Torah. Well, so uh, Abraham. Yeah, Abraham half sister. Are we um, sure if he's half sister? Well, that's what he says um, in another part of Genesis. Okay. Uh, of course, that could be a a lie or incorrect, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, so. My take on it, so Jubilees, um, according to Jubilee's account, all pretty much all the pre-flood patriarchs slept with their sisters as their wives. So Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, um, at, at least in the beginning. And then a little bit later, then it starts becoming cousins. So okay i need to rephrase so i said i said all the pre-flood patriarchs but i actually think it's only the first few generations and then it becomes cousins um which cousins are not outlawed in the torah but you have to think about why does the torah outlaw sibling um relationships and i would actually go so far so you know with me with my controversial beliefs I would go so far as to say that there's nothing inherently immoral about, when I say inherently, I mean at the core, um, the core morality, there's nothing inherently immoral about siblings marrying and having children from a divine, from an ultimate divine will. There's nothing immediately abhorrent about that. The reason we find it so objectionable is two reasons. One, because of culture, which is important. You know, culture can sometimes convey valid values. But there is also the case of the scientific health reason. And I think that's the main reason that the Torah outlaws it. And that is, siblings are too close genetically for a safe reproduction. Um, True. We, we know that certain figures in the scriptures are said to have married their uncle or their aunt. Like Moses' father, for example. Moses' father was named Amram, and Amram married his own aunt, Jochebed. 
who is the daughter of Levi. And so, um, but there was no condemna condemnation whatsoever in the scriptures of that relationship. Because in my understanding, those relationships, there was nothing inherently immoral about it. It becomes immoral because it has eventually become a health issue. In the beginning, it was not a health issue. Therefore, it was, there was nothing wrong with it. So my take on it is the Torah outlaws unhealthy sexual relationships, unhealthy or unnatural sexual relationships. Unhealthy would be relationships that are too close genetically. Unnatural would be relationships such as homosexuality and other things like that, which would be classified as unnatural. Um, another one would be um, bestiality. It outlaws that because it's unnatural. But in regards to your sibling or your aunt and uncle, those are classified as um, not as unnatural, but as uh, unhealthy. Um, so the Torah's law, the Torah has core principles, and those core principles do not change. The principles of the Torah is do not do do not do things that are unhealthy. So in the beginning, if something was unhealthy, it was not allowed to be done. If it was healthy, it was. But in the process of time, if something becomes unhealthy to do when it once wasn't unhealthy, but now has become unhealthy, now it is banned, even though it wasn't before. The law hasn't changed, the law of don't do unhealthy things, but the the circumstance of what is unhealthy has changed. It's, it's comparable to what the law says about eating animals. Before the flood, we were not supposed to eat any animals whatsoever because it's unhealthy prior to the flood. There seems to be scriptural evidence that after the flood, the, our bodies changed their natures in such a way so that it was now no longer unhealthy to eat animals. Therefore, the law reflects that and says it's now permitted to eat animals because it's no longer a threat to your health. So that's my take on it. Um, and in regards to uh, some who might object, you, you just have to remember that at some point, what, whatever the case is, whether it be the Bible or evolution, at a certain point back in history, there has to be a point where the first humans reproduce with their siblings. Because if you keep going back, there has to be parents. And eventually you go back, it goes back to two. And so when you go that far back, it has to be that somewhere along the line, there were siblings that were intermarrying or not marrying, but interbreeding. Um, You're not telling me that there were no people on earth when, um, when these patriarchs were born. I mean, even science tells us that the human types of people populated the earth two million years back. These, these so, people, when they come out of the garden, there's all kinds of other ones around. That's the only reason that they set up seraphim around the garden to guard it. Because so, there were other people and lots of them. I don't personally think that, but that's not what I was saying. What I was saying is wh whatever case you believe about the scriptures, if, if what you're saying is true, that there were other humans, it, in either case, who, who was the original humans? If there, if there, so if what you're saying is true, that there were other humans at that time, that means there were humans before Adam and Eve, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so those humans, who came before them? Well, other humans came before them. Who came before them? Other humans. And if you keep tracing it back, eventually you get to a point where the, there was the first humans. How many humans were there in the first humans? However many there were, I believe, uh, I believe eventually it would go back to two or one. If, if you keep going back through through history prior to the Bible, if you believe 
in evolution, uh, if you keep going back, eventually you have to get to the point where there was originally the, the original two humans. And so their, their children would have had to interbreed, uh, from what I understand. All right. Well, you know, we're, we're talking about the time of the patriarchs was about 4,000, 3,000 BC. And if our own wisdom comes, comes to the understanding that there were people on the earth back as far as 2 million years, I'm not talking about them. You, you see, uh, there are two creations in the Bible. And I'll bring this up again. There's the manufacture of men and woman, women in Genesis 1, and then the forming of a man in Genesis 2. They're absolutely contradictory stories. So uh, this pre-Adamic race, I'm just saying that the people had already been on Earth and actually been civilized up to 4000 BC when Adam comes along. And so they were out there and else how would Cain build a city? But look, here's a couple other examples. I was thinking of Amnon, the son of David, the oldest mm -hmm. son, mm -hmm. and his sister. What, what was his sister's name? Um, Tamar. Tamar, yeah. And he got his just recompense for doing that. He not only conjugated with his sister, but he raped her. Right. So there we have an, a, a bad example in the Bible of that happening. And let me see, there was one other point I wanted to bring up, but I can't remember it now. It's hard enough to talk at all at my stage. So yeah, well, we see that our understandings kind of come together. Of course, back in the time of the prehistoric Eve, so-called, in Africa, where they, some years ago, they traced back the first human, and then they decided this wasn't a human after all. Somebody, if there was one person manufactured, that, that person had to have relations with their sister. However, the first account of creation in Genesis 1 says that he, he multiplied them on the earth. So I'm kind of thinking that Elohim, in his creation, put manufactures, that's the actual word used in the Hebrew, put all these people on the earth ahead of time, and they went on for, I don't know, a million, two million years. And then, then in the second chapter, Elohim sets up a garden, actually, in the second chapter, it's Yahweh, sets up a garden and puts... And the, the verb changes, the verb changes to eplasticine there, which means uh, to form with the hands, like plastic. We get the word plastic from that. Plastic means that it, something can be formed. If it can be formed, it's plastic. We've got a different kind of man there. Not the manufactured man, but we've got a special man that's created uh, personally by Yahweh, out of the dust of the ground, and then a woman, same thing. And so we got, uh, they're in the garden for who knows how long. We just don't know. So According to Jubilee, seven years. Seven years in the garden? Okay. For Jubilee, that's, yeah. that's good. So I'm thinking that your Jubilee's reference at the first may be the, um, the Jubileer, didn't have the information that Genesis provides of two different creation times. And if you think about just one, of course, if there's just a man and a woman, um, then there's got to be a conjugation there. But then again, you think about Adam and Eve, they weren't brother and sister. Although they were related, they weren't related in such a way as a brother and sister. And then we wonder if Adam had a belly button. <laughs> yeah. That could be a good question. Well, another thing I think, I, I believe personally that Adam and Eve may have had hair over their bodies. Um, like, uh, because originally, 
according to Jubilees, animals could speak audibly. And humans are not too different from normal animals. So I believe it's very likely that the original humans had hair all over their bodies like animals do. And then because they started wearing clothes over time, our genetics adapted to the fact that we wear clothes and basically the, our genetics basically told our bodies that we don't need to have hair anymore. So our, our future offspring were being reproduced with less and less hair until a point where now no one has hair anymore. Uh, I mean, we have a little bit, but not anything comparable to what animals have. Um, animals my... have fur. Yeah, fur hair. Same thing. All right. Here's something that just came up in my mind was, um, do you think that men and women are supposed to shave off hair? Or does that have really any reflection in the Torah? I know it talks about men growing beards. Um, so, I mean, there are indications according to some interpretations of Torah of of uh, men not uh, not shaving their beards, for example. Um, you have things like that. You also have Paul's interpretation. Uh, hold on one sec. Some, someone keeps keeps uh, messaging me. I'm gonna have to I have to tell them that I'm busy. Sorry, one sec. Uh, Jackson, why don't you uh, talk for a minute? All right. I'll bring on another question then while you're okay. doing that. And this is a simple question. It's what is Ephesians 5, 11 through 14? And I'll read it for you. I, I did look it up and put it down here. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Messiah will shine on you. Now, so the, he asked, what does it mean? Oh, no, this, that's a different one. So what was Go, it? Ephesians, what was it? Ephesians 5, 11 through 14. I think it's just perfectly clear here. Um, Take no, so, no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. Isn't that what we do all the time? That's what we're supposed to do. Um, so, okay. So I, I messaged the person. So sorry about that. Um, I, I wanted to basically say about what we were talking about. Um, Paul gives his perspective of how he believes that women are supposed to have long hair and and men are supposed to have short hair you know um, and there's debate about whether that's grounded in the torah or not um i think there is some basis for that but that it's more of an implied unless the original torah had something like that but in our current copies of torah there's no clear law about it but we do have certain things um which may imply certain aspects. Like for example, the, the law says that when a woman is being accused for adultery, her head is to be uncovered, almost implying that a woman's he he head is to be covered, uh, her hair is to be covered. Um, so maybe that's where Paul gets the law about uh, the head covering thing. Maybe that's where he gets that idea. I don't know. Um, but then there's a Nazarite thing, for example, where men can have long hair. Um, and the fact that we have so the, the Nazarite aspect basically says that to be holy, a man and woman can make the vow and then they're not allowed to cut any hair. But there's no specification that says that a man and woman must cut hair or that they cannot cut hair under normal circumstances. So the it, implication it, actually is that women ought to grow their hair. I don't think yeah. it, it's one of those things that Paul 
says, but not necessarily of the Lord. Yeah, so it's like um, there's certain cultural things that make it seem like women are supposed to grow their hair long. But whether it's an actual sin, if they don't, I think the thing that the Torah focuses on, it, it says that a man is not to wear the garments of a woman and a woman is not to wear the garments of a man. And I think the very point of those statements is that it's basically speaking against the perversion of sexuality that we have in our society today. Speaking against transgenderism, speaking against um, drag queens, basically men trying to feminize themselves and women trying to masculinize themselves. So I think it comes down to heart intent. Why is the woman having short hair? Short hair typically is associated with more masculine qualities. On the other hand, um, there are clear examples in Torah where women are commanded to have short hair. For example, if a woman was to come down with a leprosy or a skin disease, she was to cut her hair in order to purify her body. Similarly, in Deuteronomy, a captive of war was to shave her head. A, 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 a woman, virgin, captive of war, Deuteronomy chapter 21, I believe it is, she had to cut her hair to signify uh, her purification period and that she was mourning the loss of her relatives. Um, and, and like I said, men are to have long hair if they're a priest or if they're a Nazarite. So I don't know if it's necessarily a black and white thing, but I think the general principle is why are you doing it? Why do you have long hair? Why do you have short hair? If you, if you have it for um, sexual reasons, and when I say sexual, I mean gender reasons, um, like trying to be more feminine, trying to be more masculine, then it really depends on if you're a man, you should be masculine. If you're a woman, you should be feminine. But that's more about, that's more about the face and head hair that doesn't really address the, the legs or the arms or the back. So, you know, some women shave their armpits, some women shave their legs, some don't. And then I don't see anything wrong with, with either way. And, but I would argue that, so when it comes to length of hair, like it's debatable about, you know, trimming or cutting, but the hair's there for a reason. So it seems like it would be very illogical to say, like, for example, women, women who grow hair on their, their legs, arms, and their armpits. If, if women are supposed to shave those areas, then why is the hair there in the first place? It wouldn't make sense for the creator to give women hair in those places if they're not supposed to be there. On the other hand, if it's okay for women to shave those areas, uh, like the, the very fact that they have hair in those places naturally implies that if, if people follow with what nature is given to us, then they should not shave that off. It's one thing to trim it, but it seems unnatural to remove what nature has given the male and the female. That's, just, that's my take. All right. Well, I know that in those days that uh, the women of Rome shaved their legs, shaved their hair under their arms, but peasants didn't, of course. So it, there was probably some kind of dispute about that at that time. But here's another one that's worth talking about, and that comes from Jesse. Um, what about men's head coverings? I'm, a, I'm an advocate that men generally did not wear hair coverings, according to sociologists of that time. It was not the usual thing to, for men to wear hair co head coverings. And also, we see Jesus depicted with long hair all the time. Um, I, I don't know why that is, but I would imagine that if Paul is saying that short hair for a man, that Jesus would have had short hair as well. I, so what I, about men's hair coverings, head coverings? Well, I think the reason they say it for Jesus or Yeshua is because uh, some people believe that he was a Nazarite. 
actually. I think some people believe that Yeshua was a Nazarite, so they uh, attribute long hair to that, I think. Um, but yeah, for head coverings, there's actually scripture which says that male priests are required to wear a head covering. And um, priests under the new covenant, like bishops and presbyters or elders, they're required to wear head coverings. So um, the way I see it, head coverings are for long hair. Whether you're a man or a woman, if you have long hair, head coverings are for you. But it seems according to scripture, the head coverings were mainly for holy congregations so like if you if you're in a priestly situation anyone who has long hair should cover their head but if they're outside in public then they don't need to cover their head mm -hmm. for those reasons um, could it be because of the the te temple service or synagogue service that they need to cover their hair or food service because men today have to cover their hair if they're going to serve food or anybody. Yeah, long yeah it could, it could, it could be food. It could, it could be, um, it could be hygienic. Because we know the Torah was very much focused on health, so that certainly could be. And health was connected with holiness in many ways. So that's I haven't actually thought about that before, but that is a interesting theory and idea that could explain. I mean, pa Paul attributes it to angels. Um, wear head covering because of the angels um some so, people think when paul says that that he means that angels wear a head covering so angels don't lust after you but i don't think that's actually what it means so uh concerning the men's head covering what you're saying is that generally men that you would see here and there did not wear head coverings and that's what i've read too that there are special occasions for that, especially in religious services to show uh, veneration for Elohim. But uh, generally men didn't if they were just going about, they didn't wear head coverings. Right, that, that's what I would say. They, okay. they did not, um, you know, but in special circumstances, like what we talked about, holy services. Um, if you're going out to war, men would wear helmets. Um, if it's cold outside, you know, people might wear a hat to keep their head warm. These are all very specific things, but they didn't wear a head covering for style mm -hmm. or modesty. It was the woman who wore head coverings for modesty. You, you have some apocryphal writings which kind of indicate that women are supposed to wear head coverings um, when they're going about in public for uh, modesty's sake. Um, whether you agree with that or not, the, the whole idea of the ancient times, they were they were much more protective of women um, in terms of modesty and making sure they were covered. Consider the practicality too of lice in those days. Maybe maybe women were to wear head coverings so as not to uh, bring the lice population up. Because yeah. I know that it mu they must have been infested with lice all the time. Yeah. Okay. There's some practical reasons as well. But I know that uh, in Orthodox Judaism, you go into the shul, you've got to have a head covering. Some Hebrew Roots groups demand that you cover your head. I got thrown mm -hmm. out of a uh, Hebrew Roots at the Assembly of Yahweh. I was there with a woman who didn't wear a head covering, didn't believe that was necessary, and we got thrown out. <laughs> we were told to leave. Mm. So uh, I'm thinking about whether that is a necessary rule for people that are in uh, certain groups that practice that or make people practice that. Well, it does, like for example, um, there seemed to be some flexibility with like what Paul said too. Like, for example, when he was talking, when he was talking to a woman, the woman in the, in the congregations, he said, if you are, if you are unwilling to cover your head, then shave your head. Um, almost, almost giving wiggle room for women didn't necessarily have to, if they, if they didn't want to wear a head covering, they could, they could cut off their hair. And, um, so they didn't have to. Uh, By the way, on that last question. Do you have any sisters? Me? 
you got a sister, don't you? I have one sister. Okay. Did you ever think of marrying your sister? Nope. All right. Another thing for you, uh, Andrew. What about you? Perhaps you, no, I don't have any. Perhaps you could uh, focus in your camera a little better because you're really blurry. Okay. Yeah, that happens sometimes. So the, hold on. We want people to see you just as you are. Come just as you are. That's better. Yeah, it, um, it, it gets messed up sometimes. There, good, good. So um, it was like that the whole time, right? Yeah. Oh, Should sorry we go back that. to that last question about the Ephesians, Ephesians 5? All right. Yeah. yeah. You want me to read it again? Sure. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of these things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Wake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Messiah will shine on you. Now, as you know, in the epistle of Barnabas, Barnabas does not keep from speaking of those things. He lays them out succinctly what some of these uh, unfruitful works of darkness are. And in fact, in trying to translate that tome, um, trying to find out what some of those words mean is almost impossible. You have to go to secular literature to see what they mean. And I'm talking about acts that I wouldn't even speak of here. I'd be embarrassed to talk about here. You know what I'm talking about. So is there something hidden behind this take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness? Or is it clear enough to you? Um, well, I think it's just applying to a regular sense of uh, do not take part in uh, sinfulness. Uh, the darkness, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls speak about the sons of light and the sons of the sons of darkness, uh, and they basically attribute uh, disobeying the law as sons of darkness. Those who disobey the law are sons of the darkness. And um, sure, I did want to say, um, interestingly, the ver the the passage we're talking about. Um, According to some church fathers, um, the verse 14 is actually a quotation from an apocryphal book, mm -hmm. a lost apocryphal book. Um, the, it seems like the quotation is from uh, an apocrypha of Jeremiah, according to some church fathers. Paul does that a lot. Actually, you think about Philippians chapter 2 which is an, an ancient hymn, so the scholars say, that uh, came a long way, way before Paul. So it's kind of fun sometimes when reading through these New Testament books to find these kind of unprovinced quotations in there. And imagine well, there's where a lot they of came them. from. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot. All right, ready for another. Oh, uh, what does it mean? I will give you rest. What's the source of the quotation, do they say? Well, I'd say the Gospels. He doesn't give a source here. But um, he says something like, give me your burden. Mm. My burden is light. And I will give you rest. So what does it mean? I think that it means just exactly what I'm going to speak about tomorrow morning in the service. And that is people being worried, dismayed, and so involved in the things of this world, worries, unbeliefs, um, false beliefs, being so conveyed into those things that they become a hindrance to your entire life. And I think he's saying, give these to me 
said, my burden is light. Like in Pilgrim's Progress, for instance, you have Pilgrim who's going through all these horrors to get to the celestial city. And it says at a particular time that Christian becomes Christian at this point. He said the prayer that brought conversion and his burden fell off and ran down into a cave and that the rocks fell down in the cave and buried that burden for good. So I'm putting in a little plug for tomorrow morning mm -hmm. where I'm speaking about the millennium. This is, I think, the fourth section on that. And uh, what about people today that are so concerned, say, about this election? Of course, it's something to be concerned about. But I know people around me that are absolutely possessed by it, listening to over and over to speeches, political speeches, day and night, and speculating what's going to happen. Well, let me say, living in a fantasy world. Let me say, um, I believe giving the rest refers to giving us peace, freeing us from worries. You know, uh, he says, what, what will worrying do for you? Uh, worrying cannot do anything for you. Uh, you know, it says, don't worry about what tomorrow, you know, tomorrow today has enough trouble or whatever, you know. Um, basically, we also know that rest is associated with the Sabbath and there's the type, typological significance of giving a Sabbath rest where we no longer have to exhaust ourselves with labor and we receive um, we, we can relax and enjoy ourselves. So I think it's very much relaxing, enjoying, uh, peace, not worrying, and not having to labor uh, exhaustively any, anymore. Well, let's see. Somebody here, I think it was Vicky, going back on the chat a little bit. Uh, yeah, there is a difference between concern and worry. Yes, of course. I would think that worry would be the thing that would drag a person down into depression. Especially if a person is a worrier, they're worrying about a lot of things. And a lot of things you can't do anything about. I mean, there's no use fretting over it. Just give it over to Yeshua. I do think concern and worry are pretty close, though. And I would say, like, Scripture speaks about against pride, for example. But in other places, it says to, to be prideful. Scripture speaks against boasting, but in some places, it, it encourages boasting. Um, I would say for worry, worry is not always wrong. Um, but it's, it's, it's the context. Like, so, for example... Hate, hate is not always wrong. We're, we're, we're kind of told to believe that hate is always wrong, but that's not the case. There are some things which we should righteously hate. Um, especially, you know, sin, sin, of course, we're supposed to hate. But many people associate hate as a negative thing, but it not, it's not always. Same thing with worry. Worry has a negative connotation because worry tends to mean an obsessiveness. Mm, yeah. You're fixated on it, just like what you talked about, Jackson. With with the election, people are so worried about it because they're obsessed with it. I think that's not good. But if you're worried about it in the sense of a of a general concern, like like what Vicky said, said a, a concern, you're concerned about it, but you're not constantly thinking about it. You're not obsessing over it. I think in that sense, worry is fine. If you if you take the worry and then you it's okay to feel it in the moment, but then don't keep feeding into it. Just get, give it off, give it off to God, give it off to Yahweh. Don't keep focusing on, on it. That's what I would say. Gonna lay my burdens down. 
Hold on a second. We, we should just do a, uh, a Q&A next week where you're just singing, singing the whole time. Okay. I could do that. That'd be, that'd be fun. And, and, the Q, and the Q&A could be people uh, asking us to sing certain songs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you sing this song? Sure. I know a lot of songs because I was a nightclub entertainer for a number of years, but they're all 30 years old, too. When were dinosaurs around and how did they die, according to the Bible? Oh, is that another question? That's the next one. It's a hoax. It's fake news. Go on. Uh, no, uh, so dinosaurs, uh, I mean... Well, one of the big problems with dinosaurs is that uh, they've reconstructed dinosaurs uh, from fragments of, of bones. Now, some of them are valid reconstructions because they found most of the skeleton. But most of the time, the dinosaur was not preserved completely. And the reason we know that it's very fishy and, and subjective and suspicious is that they have reconstructed a human bone like they reconstructed a human skeleton out of bones from pigs before um we we know this uh they've done the same thing with with apes they they have actually uh reconstructed a human skeleton but then later they said oh actually this was just a regular ape whoops sorry about that um there's different names for it i think one of them is called the peltman or Pelt down man yeah, Peltdown Man. I got some pictures um, of them here. Yeah, so when there's things like that, it definitely makes me more hesitant to put faith or trust in what they're saying about the fossils. But we have enough evidence from some fossils that we do know dinosaurs did exist, but not necessarily the way, not necessarily the exact structure that they're telling us, but certainly some of them did in fact exist. And so how did that happen? Well, some of them may have been truly created by in the beginning, but others may have been, oh, that's gross. <laughs> yeah, that's Barnum's, uh, uh, Barnum's uh, mermaid. <laughs> Other dinosaurs could have been made um, due to the Nephilim incident where you, you know you have in, in uh, Greek and other cultures a bunch of hybrid monsters being born, you could certainly have a lot of monsters being born due to the, due to the watchers coming down and messing with, with nature. I mean, even today, scientists are messing with nature right now. They are genetically modifying animals. They're taking salmon. Right now, this is actually happening. They take salmon, the fish salmon, and they're taking plant genetics and inserting plant genetics into salmon and other another weird stuff that they're doing they're doing a bunch of weird stuff with animals and taking stuff from other animals and splicing it together cloning animals creating hybrids that are unnatural so the fact that we're doing this definitely opens the possibility that this happened already when the watchers came down and taught mankind secrets of nature and science and so I think the best explanation for dinosaurs is a mix of the Nephilim issue as well as before the flood, the environment was different. So creatures seem to get bigger. So for example, um, dragonflies got, were much bigger than they currently are. They, they, we actually have a fossil of a dragonfly from the ancient times and it's huge, unbelievably huge. So, yeah, well, take your Briar's ice cream. They, they mix that with um, DNA from an amphibian. I'm trying to think of what the name of it. It looks like a cross between a fish and a frog in order to make your ice cream creamier. I think there are more things like that than we can possibly imagine right now. Yeah, in in food uh, through DNA uh, re uh, oh, I can't think of the word reinterpreting DNA. And, and if you ask, pretty scary. If you, 
if you ask people like Laura on the call right now, um, dinosaurs may in fact still be here. Mm -hmm. According, uh, some people like Laura believe that uh, in certain parts of the world, uh, even even in North America here, but in especially in in forests like uh, deep deep wooded areas in Africa, there may be dinosaurs hidden in those places. Obviously, if there were, they'd have to be smaller. But, and, a, and a lot of cultures throughout history believe, said that dragons existed. They, they had some idea of a dragon. Yeah. Interesting. How about Megadon? Or yeah. Behemoth? Or Leviathan? Or Lotan? Yeah, right, right. Well, of course these things existed at one time or the other. When I was taught back in Baptist Bible school as a child that the devil and his angels scattered these bones about to deceive people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they scattered the bones about to deceive people. So if you ever hear that there were dinosaurs on earth, not to believe it because it was the devil's lie. Yeah, that seems very dumb in my opinion, of course. Yeah, me but, too. Uh, <laughs> I never believed that, even as a kid. Wasn't that gullible? How many days did Daniel fast and pray? Well, before we answer that, I just have a question. Um, you're talking about Slavonic version of Josephus, right? Yeah. Now, wasn't that already translated? So, what what are you referring no. to? You're you're doing a Hebraic version or something? No, look, it was it was translated. However. If you want to get it in its fullness, the book is seven hundred plus dollars. In that, in the Slavonic Josephus, I understand that to be, and so do other people, the first antiquities, the first war. I'm sorry, the first Jewish war version that Josephus wrote. He says himself he wrote it in Aramaic. And of course, that would be spread out for the Jews in the dispersion. In fact, he says to the barbarians. And then when he's called on to do a new translation of it in Greek, he changed it a lot. He added a lot. He took out a lot. And a lot of what he took out had to do with Yahshua, because he does speak of him at least six or seven times in the complete Slavonic version. There is an excerpt floating around that purports to be from the Slavonic version, but it's not, it's not in there. So what I'm saying is I was able to look up the law concerning this text. And because there is a law about libraries that if a book is either very rare or very expensive, a PDF can be made of it and distributed. So I got this PDF and as I read through it, I thought, I read through uh, interpaginated between the Slavonic and the Greek versions of Jewish war. And the Slavonic version has so much stuff in it that was taken out when it went to the Greek version. But I thought this needs to be made available to everybody here. And so some of it was obscure and I went through there and I tried to make it a lot plainer in our days of English. I can't say I translated it, though I did translate a few words, but what I did was, was to make it understandable to us and put in notes. So I'm about two thirds of the way done with this. It's a lengthy, lengthy piece of work. I think I'm up to about 175 pages. And I've got a proofreader now, so pretty soon I'll be able to come out with that. And I just Who, want to make it available to everybody. Who's the proofreader? Are we allowed to know? It's, um, well, it's a, a woman named Cindy hmm. who lives in Texas that volunteered to do it. A friend of Yokanon. Okay. 
So yes, it's it's there. Most of it's done. There's a lot of the Greek version that's not in the uh, Slavonic version. However, there's a lot in the Slavonic that's not in the Greek. It is very interesting. Of course, it describes the war, but it all also goes back to the earlier wars of the first, second century BC and first century BC into the Herods a lot. And it mentions several times the followers of Yahshua, which they don't use his name. They call him, Josephus called him the wonder worker. Hmm. So anyway, if, if you're interested in what I got on that, anybody, let me know and I'll send you a copy of it. It's actually on Amazon. It is $400 instead of what you said, $700. Yeah, when I looked at it, it was $700. <laughs> it's, uh, t read the name of the book. The, the book that's 400 Yeah. $700. Uh, so now you can get it for 400 So the book is called Josephus' Jewish War and its Slavonic Version, a exactly. Synoptic Comparison. You know, I tried to find that for years and years. Before that was, I can't remember when that was published, maybe in 2005 or something like that. But long before that, I tried to find it. You couldn't even find it in the Slavonic. Now it's popping up some. But yeah. what I thought we needed was a popular translation for autodidacts like us to be able to read through there and find some more mentions of Yeshua in that work. Of course, exegetes, or I should say scholars, by and large, reject it entirely or it would have been out before. And the right. reason I think that is the case is because it talks so much about John the Baptist and the wonder worker and his people in there where they just simply didn't want it to get out. And they still call those Christian interpolations, but I don't think they are because they fit right in with the language and style and the particular context of each passage. Yeah, I think it's definitely worth looking into. I've seen some really interesting stuff in it. Yeah, definitely. You, you look through it. Yeah. Um, some of it, yeah. Um, what's nice about the official publication that costs so much money is that um, it has the the Greek version and the Slavonic side mm -hmm. by side to compare. Um, and there's also a free PDF of it as well. Yes. Uh, uh, there is a, a, a way to get the PDF, and we found that. Do they have the PDF up there now that you can download? Uh, not legally, I don't think, but mm -hmm. uh, you can get it. Yeah, I got it. I got it about a year and a half ago after I looked into library loan. They wouldn't send it over into yeah. the legality of allowing such an expensive but important tome to be unavailable to people in general. I mean, you have so many documents which are unavailable to people in general, like the the uh, DJD series for the Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh, yeah. Um, Unless you want to pay. What are, that's thousands of dollars. You have those, don't you? Yeah, and I've shared it with pe different people. Sure, um, sure. But okay. yeah, if, if you if you actually was to to buy them yourself, you spent a lot of money. Same thing with the the Gottingen Septuagint series. Oh, we're Anyways, talking about multiple thousands of dollars. Yeah. For that series, what are there? Thirty two, thirty three books in there now? Uh, not quite, but yeah, like in the high twenties right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how what was about, the cool, next question? How many days did Daniel fast and pray? Doesn't it seem like that would be a question that anybody that had a Bible could answer? I was going to say, doesn't the Bible say, you know, um, uh, I mean, it says in, in Daniel that there's multiple, I think there's multiple instances of him fasting, uh, different fasts that he did. He didn't do always the same fast, I think. It seems like you could just pop into a browser. Uh, how many days did Daniel fast? Assuming you can spell better than I. 
Mm. Sometime soon, I'm going to be getting Logos, uh, Logos program. Yes. Now, I'm on their mailing list. Is it still like $900? Um, well, there's a free version, but you don't get yeah. all the stuff. Um, I got the free version. There's different there's different levels and they're each at different different increments of how much you you if you wanted you could pay extreme amount of money for like the full like super super full yeah. stuff which is like six thousand dollars or something crazy like that. Yes, that's right. But I'm looking into uh, getting it. I'm also looking into. Uh, I want to get a subscription for the Dead Sea Scrolls journals. They have journals for Dead Sea Scroll research. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm thinking of getting a subscription for that sometime soon. Well, I hope so, because you're like me. We share these things, if there's any call for it. Okay, this says... Give Daniel, us another question. Daniel fasted 21 days. 21 days. But that seems to me like the popular Daniel fast. Right. I would have thought the, the regular number of days is like 40 days. 40, yeah, that's what you would think. Have you ever fasted 21 days? No. Well, I'll tell you, if you ever do, don't finish up your fast with a 32-ounce Coke. <laughs> I fasted for like a, for a week. That's good. But not more than that. Okay. Who was the first anointed king of Israel? That's another one I think you could just look up easy enough. Why are they sending this to me? Well, I know why they're sending that one because there's a, um, I, I think I do anyway. If I remember reading correctly, there is a, uh, well, okay, so there was Saul. He was the first anointed one, right? But then, after Saul, there was like an interim king or something, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong on this, but I thought I read something once where it said that someone briefly became king after Saul or something. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Well, that's easy enough answered. How about this one? This one's pretty non sequitur, but we'll put it here anyway. Did Luther remove books from the Bible? I know he wanted to, but I believe that he translated both the uh, I, three testaments, including the Apocrypha. He put, yeah, he put them like in an appendix, uh, stuff he yeah. didn't like. Well, the thing well I know he mind... didn't like James and he didn't like Revelation. Right. Mm -hmm. The thing is, People speak often a lot about Apocrypha being taken out, but it wasn't, it's not really quite the, the, the correct take on it. Because the problem is the Apocrypha always had a separate status. They were scripture and authoritative, but they were on a different level. Mm -hmm. And over time, people differed on what level they thought it was. Um, so the church throughout history predominantly used the Apocrypha as valuable documents, but they did not believe them to be as authoritative. Some people, some congregations did not believe them to be as authoritative as the, the core Bible mm -hmm. documents. But when then I you read... I'm sorry. What I read was that the reason the rabbinical authority didn't include them is because they were originally written in Greek. Now, that was the only reason. However, since then, we found books of the Apocrypha in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So whether they were written in Hebrew or Greek, it's just that it was, uh, they had a course of anti-Greek feeling at that time, but I'm kind of thinking that the scholars that put together the Septuagint considered the books that they put in there as being scripture, or they wouldn't have done that, yeah. put them in the Alexandrian library. Yep. Um, now, to be fair, the Septuagint, when it was created, 
it wasn't created like all at once. It was created separately. Um, the, orig the original was just the five books of the Torah. The, and then over time, more and more books were translated into Greek. And then, and then it was in the early centuries of, of Christianity where the different Greek documents were, were put together into a single book. Because originally, back in the, in the days of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were still writing things in scrolls. So a scroll was not big enough to have the entire Bible on it. They had to put it on separate scrolls. Sure. But when, they sw when scribes started switching the book format, then they could put the whole Bible in one book. So really the Septuagint came to exist after they started writing scriptures on books, uh, which would have been later. Um, like the Septuagint as a, as a complete unit. Um, but I think, uh, I think Luther and some of the others downgraded the Apocrypha. Because like, for example, the, the King James Version, they included the Apocrypha in, in the King, original King James. They just put it as an appendix. But a hundred years later, Christians stopped printing the Apocrypha in King James Bibles. So, so it was over time that they changed their opinion on yeah. the Apocrypha. There were four objections, as I recall. One was that the Apocrypha supposedly mm, uh, put a stamp of approval on suicide. Hmm. That was one. Remember in the Maccabees, you've got the Maccabean brothers yeah. and their mother, and they were all killed in front of the mother. And right. there were three other ones, but they were semi-ridiculous, and you could find the same things in the so-called authoritative scriptures. In the regular Old Testament, yep. Yeah, same thing. All right, that was good. Do we have any good questions? Um, I, mean, I don't mean that. What I mean is um, we, we have about 15, 20 minutes left. Are there any... Yeah. Deep big, questions? Yeah, deep questions for the... That yeah, this cover? might be one of them. Is it true or false that historical interpretation is based on the historian's judgment on how the past should be seen? You say that's, that's true or false? That's a compl complicated question. It is. Um, I would say there's a lot of assumptions made and pre-conclusions made about what history is. And then, then the scholars filter the documents through their preconceived notions about history. I say that happens a lot. Kind of like with this Slavonic Josephus thing. They believe history has to be a certain way and therefore Slavonic Josephus does not fit in their worldview, so they have to disregard it. Okay, I put the question up on chat here. I'm looking at this long list of scriptures that are on the chat. That's from Laura about dinosaurs. Yeah, I haven't seen this before. Oh, yeah. Good. Thank you. That's a good list. Where did you get that out of Halley's Bible Com uh, commentary? You didn't just knock those off off the top of your head, did you, Laura? It looks like she's quoting at least partially from Wikipedia. Okay. She said she found them herself. Good for you. Wow, uh, I am really I, impressed. I think she has like, she might have like a document file where she has the verses or something. Mm -hmm. I'm going to save that. Now for unicorns specifically, um, the evidence indicates that unicorns were actually rhinoceroses. There's yeah, some or, evidence evidence for or that. Behemoth was like a hippopotamus. Well, I'm not sure about that one, but uh, 
I have I have heard that. Yeah. Um, As for the question at at hand, I'll say yes. Historical in interpretation is, of course, based on a histo historian's judgment, but they're supposed to be objective. That's the goal. Uh huh. But primarily. Well, I can't say all, but an awful lot of historians, they want to prove their thesis. Right, right. And they build off other people without checking their work yeah, many true. times. Um, now, this is relevant, but it's not quite the question. But basically, I mean, I mean it's related. Basically, so I've been doing some research this week on uh, different historical books. Basically what I'm trying to do, not only for my Bible project, I also have other projects for like, I want to write a book of history, history of non-biblical stuff as well as biblical stuff. So um, I want to know what books are out there and then kind of like summarize the content of those books and put them all together in a massive compilation, giving us the general history of the world. And um, I, I, I plan to do a very unique uh, version of the history of the world. And, and I will use a bunch of different sources that regular historians don't really give a lot of credence to. Or they do, but they kind of overlook. Um, I think there's so much amazing history out there. And if we, if we do more study, we may come to the conclusion that a lot of what scholars say about history is actually incorrect. Um, I think there's so many assumptions that are made which have not been proven to be true. So my goal, one of my goals is to study the ancient historical documents and then convey to you guys Good. Uh, the cool stuff about it. That, I've that is a very worthy goal, especially today. People of religious bent just don't know the history. And so they're easily led into all kinds of crazy notions simply because they don't know what has happened before. Especially when something happens over and over and over again, they don't know. And of course my work in Revelation, I have a, a hard time getting anybody to understand that simply because they think that using history or scholarly sources are blasphemous. <laughs> Sometimes even educated people are blasphemous. Now, I've got one more question here that ought to take up a little bit of time, but it's not, it's not a religious or Bible question, but it's a good one. Okay. Did people use the F word very often in daily life during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the same way that they do now? I wouldn't know about that. Um, Jackson, though, you, no. you, you, Jackson, you probably were you probably were a teenager in those years, right? In the, in the, 30, <laughs> in the 30s? <laughs> you pull the same joke on me as I do on old, old guys. <laughs> well, I was around in the 50s, and the answer is no, not at all. I think it just started being used commonly with uh, entertainment. Those people in entertainment are filthy in every way, it seems to me, because of what they come out with. And when I hear that a Christian did this or that movie, I think, how in the world could they get through that movie with playing the part of a person that swears all the time or is disrespectful to the deity? And the only way I can think of is that through entertainment. Now look, if you're 20, if you're 30 years old, you should be able to see very clearly that the use of the word has become more and more and more frequent to the point where I overhear people talking sometimes, just using it like every other word. Yeah. 
and, and it, it wasn't like that before, not at all. But there are other words that were, that became popular in the 40s, like screw. Now it's nothing for someone to say, oh, screw you. Right. And it's not even considered to be out of the common tongue now, but in those days it was. When I was young to say screw, you got your face slapped. Yeah. But not, not now. Now I'll tell you a story. It's funny how this question came along. When I was in the first grade, I had my little desk mate use that term about every other word. And so I came home uh, to my mother and I said to her, what the F is wrong with you, mom? <laughs> and uh, that was the first time I ever used the word and she slapped my face and knocked me to the ground. <laughs> Don't ever use that word again. <laughs> It was a lesson that I remembered. It is still yeah. offensive to me. Wow. Anybody well, else? <laughs> um, I mean, it definitely has been used way more than it used to be used. But uh, at the same time, um, the thing is, I don't really see any difference between that word and like, like, okay, so let's say, you know, let's say you're talking about a man and a woman getting married and you say, and you, and you're, and you're, and you're like talking with your kids and trying to teach them the birds and the bees. And you say to them, when a man and a woman love each other and they get married, then they have sex. You, you tell them, you say those words, have sex, but I don't see any difference between saying those words and saying the F word. Um, to me, it's the same exact thing. It means the same thing. Uh, so for me, I don't see anything wrong with those words. What I see wrong with is the perverted use of those words. So whether you say F you or, or some perverted thing, like, you know, screw you, like you said, you know, that's another example. Um, there's all kinds of different things where you don't have to say, it doesn't matter what words you use. If you're, if you're conveying an offensive idea, it's wrong, but it's, it's not offensive to talk about sex in a, in a accurate, valid way. You know, like, for example, if you, if you're married and you have a wife or husband, and you wanna, you wanna be intimate with them. There's nothing wrong with talking to them and saying, "I wanna, f, I wanna f you," or you know, "I want to have sex with you," or whatever. There's nothing wrong with using those words because that's what those words mean. But if you try to say, if you try to use those words per, for a profane reason, like attacking someone, insulting them. Um, you're so effing stupid or whatever, you know, those type of things, not only are you being offensive to the person, but you're being offensive by appealing, by twisting the nature of sexuality into something bad. Yes. It's like, it's like saying, it's like how people say, oh God, you're so annoying. Oh God, you're so annoying. They are, they are abusing the name of God or the word God in a very offensive and wrong way. But if you're praying to God and you say, oh God, you know, you're praying or you're talking about the Bible and say, God did this, blah, blah, blah. That's not wrong. But, but when you're using it as an offensive term or phrase, that's when it becomes bad. So for the F word, I have no problem with it if it's used in a pure, righteous way. Okay, look. Some people have said the word just means making love. But it seems to me that effing is probably the opposite of making love. It's something that is harsh, offensive, 
out of love, something a rapist would say, maybe. But then I'm old fashioned. <laughs> I was wondering if Vicky might look that up sometime and tell us maybe next time what the real or origination of that word is. Now, uh, Vicky says, Lao Onia, how is used in a righteous way? I've never used it in a righteous way. Well, maybe you ought to get started with it. Well, for Start example, the there, there's, a city in, there's a city in another country that has the name Fuking, but it doesn't mean anything bad at all. It's not even related to the sinful uh, uh, meaning. It's not even related to that word. It just so happens to be spelled the same, but it's pronounced differently. Uh, but people actually live there. Um, and some people, some tourists go there and take pictures of the sign of the town because they think it's funny. But, but the people who live there don't think it's funny. That's their town's name. Um, so that's an example of it being acceptable. Um, Vicky says but, that's an irrelevant example. No, I, if you ask, is it not? Yeah. So I, I don't say it's irrelevant because the the way the word is being used, oh, the, the, like for example, we, 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 have, we have crap and we have shit. They mean the exact same thing, but we say one is wrong and the other is not wrong. It doesn't make sense. Um, and then for example, the B word, the B word, right? Uh, B? Oh, yeah. Yeah. A female dog, it means, right? Well, according to the, according to the uh, Bible, the Messiah made some very similar insults. Um, True. He, he, he called people brood of vipers. That, that's sons of snakes. And that's almost identical to the phrase son of a bitch. You son of a bitch, you son of a viper. There's not really any difference between those. those that's a harsh thing to say. Um, and Messiah called people foxes in a negative insulting way. Um, he damned people too. Matthew yeah. 23. Yeah. Damn you, Pharisees. Yep. Yeah. So, um, it really, the way I see it, no words are bad. You, you can't take a word and say that this word's a bad word because words are simply made up and they mean what we say them to mean. So, um, if we assign them a bad value, then it becomes bad be only because we decided it becomes bad. But if we, if we can de decide a word is bad, we can decide a word is good. We can change the word to a good meaning. So um, when you look up the etymology of these words, many of these words originally don't have anything offensive. Um, like, like if, you know, one of the classic examples is gay. Uh, that has become a insult meaning stupid. It also has come to mean a perverted lifestyle of homosexuality. Um, but it originally just meant happy. How did we come from a pure term to a impure term? That's because we abused it. But guess what? When, we, when people sing those Christmas songs, they still say our gay apparel, fa la la, you know. They still say that in the original pure sense. So it's comparable, like, like ass, for example. Ass is now considered um, wrong to say, right? But in the yeah. King James Version, it uses the word ass for donkeys. So you have to keep that in mind that all bad words aren't actually bad. They're only bad if you use them in a bad way. Well, here's the origination. I'll put it on the chat. And then we can be finished. There's what the chat says. F isn't an Anglo-Saxon word either. The F word is of Germanic origin, 
related to Dutch, German, and Swedish words for to strike and to move back and forth. It first appears, though, only in the 16th century in a manuscript of the Latin orator Cicero. And Vicky makes, Vicky makes a confession here. My oldest daughter is the queen of the F-bomb. <laughs> well, well, she's probably older, and maybe you might want to get the soap out and a couple of people to help <laughs> you to wash your mouth out. Well, let me just say one other thing. Um, so, again, like I said, it's how you use it. So when we use that F-word for, like, right, like, you stub your toe, ow, ah, F, or, or uh, this is effing this or whatever you're not using it in the way the word actually means you're 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 abusing it you're using it in a sense it's not meaning it's like like okay so for example you you know the phrase mother effer right um if you're calling someone that that's a very offensive term but if the person literally did sleep with their own mother, that's an appropriate term to use. Okay. Similarly, ba bastard means you don't, you, you are, you, your parents were not married. Um, it's offensive if, if, if they were, if your parents were married and you're just using it as an insult, but if, if they, their parents actually were uh, not married, then you, it's not wrong to use that. It's a, it's an accurate phrase. So. I'm going to look it up in Cicero because it, Cicero was a Latin orator and I'll see how it's used there because that's the origination of the world. How about Jackson, that? you want to uh, wrap things up? It looks yeah, like we got to go. Uh, thank you so much for all coming tonight again. This is fun. Hope you thought it was fun too and encouraging in some way. I want to thank... Uh, Brother Andrew Carlson for being here. His insights can go anywhere from expert to, to well, ridiculous sometimes. But we appreciate it and people like to hear it. So we're gonna put this on YouTube, see what other people say. It's been getting a lot of downloads. So keep coming and do send in some questions when you get them. Thank you all and shalom. Shalom. God be with you. Shabbat shalom.